cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Catherine, uh, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I, I really uh, appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, AJ. Yeah, most definitely. Oh, uh, you know, I have to tell you, you know, you, uh, you know, you, you stopped by earlier today and dropped off that, that bottle of wine. I opened it up and oh my goodness, that is, that is quite something. Yeah, it really has integrated nicely. And uh, yeah, I guess we can tell the audience this is a really special and specific wine. Maybe we can wait until the end. We'll build anticipation and we'll talk yeah. about it. But yeah, I'm most... so happy that you enjoyed it because it really has been on a journey since you first tasted it. It it has been. And, you know, I had to look back in my journal and the first time, uh, you know, I got to kind of be a part of that wine was, it was October 29th, uh, 2020. And uh, it has been quite, it has been on quite some journey. So I can't wait to uh, hear more about it. Excellent. So I found this, uh, this quote and, uh, I, you know, I thought it was would be a great spot to start. You have the power to be your own superhero. The little girl that you once were is relying on you to be the woman she dreamed of becoming. Uh, do you feel that you have become your own superhero? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a great question and a very good quote, especially for you to find as a girl dad. Um, I know we've talked <laughs> a lot in the past about how important it is to... Um, yeah, raise, raise daughters with lots of inspiration and enthusiasm. So do I feel like I've become my own superhero? Yeah. Um, maybe. maybe. <laughs> um, in, in a farming community, we just rely on each other so much that um, sometimes I wake up feeling like I have, I'm in control and I have um, the power to change things. And, and sometimes working in the world of wine, uh, you're at the mercy of, what nature gives you. So, uh, yeah. I, yeah. And I, you know, in, in all honesty, I think you're being, uh, uh, you need to, I, I think you need, you need to toot your horn, horn a little bit more. You've been on quite a, quite a journey, uh, you know, and hopefully we can, you know, kind of tell everybody about your journey and, uh, you know, it all kind of started up, you know, when you, you know, you grew up in Maine and there, you had like 20 or 30 cousins and that was, uh, that was something, but I, I'm curious, you seem to be like a fan of the original Super Mario Brothers. And uh, did you play Super Mario like with, with your cousins or like how did that how did that happen? Oh, absolutely. That's a really good question. Um, so I was born in 1984 in um, really rural, small town, New England, Maine. And um, my father is a musician and he was really, really big into electronics. So even though we grew up in nature, in the woods, very far away from any sort of modern culture, um, my father always had computers and synthesizers, musical equipment, PC magazine, Macworld, if you remember when those were actually oh, yeah. printed Most... magazines. Yep, yep. And um, so I grew up with a lot of geeky things around, thanks to my dad, including the original Nintendo. And we didn't have any rules about video games or screens or anything because on the weekends, my dad was always clicking around on his electronics. And so my sister and I would be downstairs in our playroom um, playing Super Mario. And uh, my sister, Chelsea, is two years younger than me. And right. she's very, very competitive. So we had the, the dueling, you know, back when you could play video games and there were like six buttons on the controller. <laughs> um, so uh, playing Mario against each other. And then we got into Sonic the Hedgehog as children of the, the late eighties and early nineties do. So, yes, um, yes, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I would play uh, super Mario brothers, you know, all the time by myself and, you know, on, you know, on the cassette player, I'd have guns and roses appetite for destruction going. And just, it was a perfect accompan accompaniment. Uh, I would tell my daughter about that, you know, you know, and she's like, what? That's no, that sounds awful. And I'm like, no, it was really good. It was a lot of fun growing up back then, uh, back before we all, all had iPads and iPhones. Um, but for me, it's, you know, those days were very influential that really shaped me into the person I am because now um, 
making wine and living in Willamette Valley. We are so tied to nature, like I said before. However, I really enjoy the creative and the artistic side of communications. Um, so I never feel like I'm living in a world of, you know, digital creation or tied to the land. I feel like I'm living in this middle place where we can really be in touch with nature and spend time in the natural world, but also, um, you know, use all the digital tools and creative uh, tools available to us to really tell the story of what we're doing. And a lot of that goes back to living in this world of the natural world without a lot of culture around, but also with all these digital um, and electronic machines that I love so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it seems, you know, that you were, um, your, your upbringing was, you know, very close knit and, you know, you had a lot of lessons that you had to go through and kind of like some, some rites of passage a little bit, you know, like firing your, your grandpa's rifle. Um, what was that for like the, the first time? I mean, I know you had to fire the rifle and you had to like drive a car across a steel bridge and whatnot, but like, yeah. Were you were you scared as all get out just firing that rifle for the first time? Or you're like, oh no, I got this. Um <laughs> I think I was like, I got this. Well, I, I know you're referencing this really great um interview uh, at the Oregon Wine History Archives where I talked about these stories growing up in rural Maine. Um and I know that you've been interviewed as well. If you are watching and you have not checked out the Oregon Wine History Archives, there are hundreds and hundreds of interviews of all of your favorite people who are here in the Lemon Valley. So check that out. Um yes. but I you know my family has some land in a little town called Bethel, Maine and it's one of those towns that uh the poet Robert Frost wrote about um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the great poet of Portland, Maine, wrote about towns like this as well. Um, they never change. And so we have a little camp there. And my great grandfather, his nickname was Zip. So it's called Zip's Place. And we have a rite of passage in the family. Well, I should say something about the culture of Maine because it's very specific. And if you haven't been there, it's hard to understand. But it's in a very, very cold climate. We are the most northeast of all states in the u.s and we're very very close to canada so most people have not been to maine and most people who grew up in maine don't leave maine so it's a very insular place um, and it's very very cold and very harsh it's not like the beautiful cold fluffy snowy weather of colorado where you just want to get out there and ski and snowboard it's right. like that harsh icy crust on the snow uh the bone chilling cold and for many generations, people lived there and they were just in survival mode. Um, so it's a very uh, like hard culture and very interested in self-sufficiency. So even though we have all the modern conveniences now, I think that still sort of runs through the culture. So when I was growing up, um, speaking of self-sufficiency, everyone in my family went to this camp in Bethel and we went through a rite of passage where when you turn 13, you learn how to shoot a deer rifle and you learn how to drive the car. And I'm not sure if we'll still be doing that with the next generation. It seems a little unsafe now that I think about it. <laughs> but um, but uh, we had this really, really old Cadillac car. And in my generation, it was all girls. So my family said, okay, girls, we're, we're going to do this. Um, and my cousins and my sister are fantastic at driving. When it came to my, my turn to drive across the steel bridge, um, it's one lane and I got a little scared. So the great family story that everybody still laughs at is that I – swerved a little bit and I scraped the entire side of the car on the bridge. Oh no. Yeah. I'm a better driver now. Uh, but no <laughs> one will let me, will let me forget that. And, uh, we have a sand pit near our camp and I learned how to fire a deer rifle. Guns are personally not my thing, but I think in terms of, um, a life story, it, my family really taught me how to be a self-sufficient, independent, young woman and they never treat us, treated us any different than the boys in the family. And I really appreciate that. And I think that is a thread that flows into my, um, leadership style today. Yeah, no. And, and I totally agree. And, you know, um, your aunt wanted to, to, to take you to Paris when you were 16 and you know, you're like, I want to go, I want to go. But your parents were like, no, you can, well, you can go, but you have to, uh, you know, you have to pay your own way. You know, so you worked at the ice cream store and whatnot. And I'm kind of curious at that time, what was your favorite flavor of ice cream? Ooh, that's a good story. So, 
Yeah, I worked in the summertime at a Ben and Jerry's ice cream scoop shop, and uh, I rode my bike one way every day to the ice cream shop, and then my father picked me up and drove me home at night. So um, I did save all of my, I saved my paycheck all summer long and paid my own way to Paris. And my uh, favorite flavor, and it remains my favorite flavor today, is peanut butter cup. Classic. Ooh. Oh, okay. That's, that's but it awesome. Can't, it can't be the peanut butter cup that is just like peanut butter flavored with a chocolate swirl. It has to have large chunks of actual peanut butter cups. That way you're oh. eating kind of like a candy bar and ice cream together. Okay. No, that, that makes complete sense. Yeah. No, that, that is, uh, I was just curious. Uh, why do, do you know, like when you were in Paris with, you know, with your aunt at, at 16, you know, mm-hmm. you know, there was, you, you've, you've mentioned like, you know, you didn't say a word or anything where you were just, just taking it all in or is just kind of a culture shock or like, do you, do you agree with, you know, all the stories saying that, you know, that you didn't say anything? Oh yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. So when we, so my aunt who decided to bring me there, she's the cool single aunt. She's always the one who has been very cultured. She was, um, a costume designer in the Shakespeare, um, troupe in Ashland, Oregon for many, many years. And she got involved in the deaf theater and was actually one of the first hearing students to go to Gallaudet, the deaf university in Washington, DC. Um, and she's always traveled the world. So she remains an inspiration to me. Um, when I was growing up in this very insular community, she always brought me to art museums. She brought me to Boston. She brought me to New York. And so finally, when I turned 16, she said, I, I want to bring you out of the country. I want to show you Paris and we'll have a girl's trip. It'll be fantastic. Um, and it, for me, it was such a culture shock because that was, um, I guess that would have been the year 2000. Yeah. So that was really before you could just get on the internet and look at a travel blog. I mean, we were on the internet, of course, but it was right. very, very hard to, to find real life information and photos and videos about what I was getting into. So I don't think anything could have prepared me for what I saw. And uh, it was just, it was a visual, cultural, and like sensory overload. I mean, the smells right. are different. It obviously looks very different. I couldn't speak French at all. Um, and I, I just wanted to absorb everything. So yeah, for me, I, I really have the mind of a writer. I view everything like a story. So I just wanted to be there and, and soak everything up. And I absolutely did. Yeah, no, it it is so fun to just observe and just, just take everything in as, as much as possible. I, um, you know, I'm quite the introspective person myself and, uh, just taking it all in is, is always a, a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And so I, for me, my treat food is definitely a pan au chocolat all the time. I love it. I <laughs> ate one every day when I was there and at the Carlton Bakery in Carlton, Oregon, they, they make fantastic pan au chocolat. Ooh. All right. I have to remember that one. Next time. Okay. I will definitely remember that. Oh, um, so you, you made the comment that, you know, those who, uh, grow up in Maine, you know, stay in Maine, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, you followed your sister out to, out to Boulder. So like how, what made her go out and then what, like, what made you like want to follow her and like leave Maine and like leave, leave the bird's nest? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was my next spot. So, um, my cool aunt again, she moved to Denver, um, and my sister moved out there as well. And I always heard fantastic stories about what they were doing and, and their lifestyle. And when I was in college, I spent, um, two years in New York city after I left Maine and that was a lot of fun, but I was having so much fun living the uh, writerly life in the West Village that I knew that if I wanted to get my degree, which is very important to me, that I needed to go back to Maine and just hunker down and and get it done. And then I would go back out into the world. So um, at that point, I was really into endurance sports and my sister was there and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, So I just packed my backpack after college and came out with my bicycle and 
crashed at my aunt's house and decided that I would just let life happen to me, which I guess is a writerly thing to do as well when you're thinking about the story of your life. And I was um, living in Denver with my aunt and I started working for a digital agency um, in downtown Denver doing marketing for clients. And I really, really enjoyed that. I love the lifestyle. And then um, after about a year in Denver, I moved to Boulder, Colorado, which is not that far away, but a completely different world. And that's when I really entered the world of technology startups. And um, that was, yeah, Boulder was the place where I really, you know, grew into myself and saw my future in front of me. Yeah, no, that, that is great. Um, so being a bicyclist myself, right. Um, uh, you were doing triathlons, but like, did you, when I talk to some triathlons, they're like, yeah, I really like the swimming. I like the running, but I really hate the bicycling. What part do you like all three parts of it? Or, you know, was there one that, uh, you preferred over one over the other? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, surprisingly, I enjoy the swimming part the best. I wish I could say cycling. Sorry, AJ. Oh, um, it's okay. <laughs> swimming is my favorite. And um, when I was in Maine, I grew up um, across the street from one of the large lakes in the lake region. And so I went swimming every single day. And it's so freeing. I love, I love open water swimming in lakes. So I really hadn't been swimming for a long, long time when I decided to start training for triathlons. So I got a membership at the local YMCA when I was in Maine before I went to Boulder. And I just loved it because um, it's so meditating. And I have a brain that doesn't turn off. So when you're swimming mm -hmm. laps and you're just looking at the bottom of the pool, um, you can't hear anything. <laughs> you can't see anything. You're just really alone with your thoughts and your breathing. And I love it so much. So when I went out to Boulder, of course, it, that's the place in the United States where all the professional triathletes train. Uh, because it's high altitude. And so we had public pools outside that were like Olympic size, beautiful, wow. gorgeous. Yeah. So I, I enjoy swimming. And now um, I'm here at my office in McMinnville, Oregon in wine country. And a few blocks away, we have the McMinnville Aquatic Center. And that's where you'll find me a few days a week, still swimming laps. That's great. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I didn't know that you still swam. So that's, that's great. Yeah. I think it's good for good for stress relief and yeah, keeps me busy. Yes. No, I totally understand. So going from like a writer's perspective and then like getting the startup bug, I, I call it like, mm -hmm. what, what was it that about startups that really uh, attracted you? Well, you know, when I was in school and when I went out to Colorado before I got involved in the startup world, um, I really saw myself as a writer and I really was interested in writing the next great American novel. So I've always done some freelance work and I've been published in a few places, but I quickly realized coming from a self-sufficient family that um, it was up to me, just like I paid my way to Paris, I am responsible for paying my way in life. And you really don't make a lot of money as a writer. So I had to come up with an alternative career strategy. and. When I was in Boulder, I really, really met so many fascinating people at one of the local coffee shops called Atlas. It's now closed um, on the main street in Boulder called Pearl Street. I started going there every day, working remotely, and I saw all these young people who are my age sitting there all day long, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> Don't you people have jobs? Um, and everyone was a CEO or a startup founder. Uh, working on a tech startup. So that was very intriguing to me. And that was the time in Boulder where there was a program that just started. It was called Tech Stars. And now they have chapters all over the world. And I started working for um, two programmers and they started a business called dailyburn.com. And it was the very first um, iPhone iOS tracker for um, food and exercise. So that seems kind of like an old idea now, but at the time iOS was brand new and it was really exciting. So uh, yeah. these two guys and they had two other programmers, they needed somebody to be the customer service person who enjoyed the culture of fitness and uh, 
who would work hard for very little money. So of course I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> and that was my entrance into the world of startups. Um, and the transition from writing to that was, I don't know, it seems so different, but, but really I think some of the, the threads that carry me into the wine industry now, or if you are a writer, you're always looking at the world through a specific lens of um, curiosity. Right. And it's like that with startups too. I mean, when you're writing, you oftentimes you don't know what is going to come out on the next page. You just sort of go with it. Um, the same, the same thing happens when you start a, a company. Yes, most, most definitely. Um, and I think at about this time, there was a, a viral video kind of going around for a new show called Portlandia. Oh, uh, I have to ask, did, did that like video, you know, or the, that series or whatever that show, did that like intrigue you and what, what brought you to Portland or like what, what actually brought you to Portland? Yeah. Portlandia was definitely a part of the story. Uh, very cliche, but so true. So, <laughs> Um, the company that I was working for, Daily Burn, was acquired by a company called IAC in New York, and it's owned by Barry Diller, and it's a big um, technology media conglomerate, and they own um, like Ticketmaster, Vimeo, College Humor. Now they own Tinder, Match, etc. So it was like a big TV studio, but for digital. And they said, okay, we've been acquired. Everyone's been working remotely. Come to New York. And it was summertime in Boulder, and I looked around and I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I, like, I have a great lifestyle. I can ride my bike to work. Um, right. I work in the coffee shops. I get to hang out all weekend. I have a good time in Manhattan, boys. Um, and then after a few months, I, I really realized that I was missing out on a huge career opportunity because, as I briefly touched on, I went to school in New York for a few years, but living there as a student and living there as a professional is totally different. So... I felt like I had some unfinished business after I left there the first time. So I decided to go back as a professional and I was there for a few years, but I knew that I was not going to be a New Yorker. Um, I lived on the Upper West Side and I live, I worked down in Chelsea, but I was riding my bike along the Hudson River every weekend and, and training. And I actually, um, you know, took the train out into the Hudson River Valley quite often to go to all the farms out there when I needed a dose of nature. So yeah, I was in my little fourth floor walk up uh, that was about the size of a closet um, and Portlandia launched and I started watching it and it was hilarious. It still is hilarious because to be honest, if you go back and watch it after living here, you're like, yep, these characters are based on real people and I actually know who they are. <laughs> um, and I knew that I wanted something more permanent in my life, but I didn't want to go back to New England. That wasn't my style. I didn't want to go back to Colorado either because I found that culture to be a little bit homogenous, especially after spending time in New York. Um, so I thought, let's go to the Pacific Northwest. I was young enough where, you know, if I didn't feel the vibe, right. I wouldn't have to lay down roots, but I did a checklist and, and Oregon really had and has everything that I wanted in my life. Um, culture, nature, people from all over the world, um, living here, moving here, um, the wine country, of course, of course. the food scene, the art scene. And I just thought the Oregon vibe is something that, that, uh, I can jive with. So I packed everything up that I had in my little apartment and I drove across the country and I drove to, I remember Venice beach and then took highway one highway goes from one Oh one to one or I don't know, um, the highway, the I coastal remember. highway that goes from Venice beach all the way up. And, uh, it was amazing. I remember hitting the Oregon border specifically because, mm -hmm. um, everyone started driving really slowly. And then everyone in the left-hand lane was really slow as well. And then people were passing on the right-hand side when they got frustrated. <laughs> uh, and people still do that. <laughs> um, but I just remember, you know, going to a storage place, um, in the afternoon, unloading my stuff on the east side in the southeast of Portland, and then driving over one of the bridges to the west side. I had rented a uh, place on Airbnb, and it was just so gorgeous. And I immediately felt like this is my home more than right. any other place I've lived. 
Yeah, no, it, it is a great spot. I, you know, I moved up here from Tennessee in 2001 and I, no, there's no way I'll, I would ever go back. There's, yeah, you know, the rain and like right now, you know, the, we're still in spring when it should be summer. Yes, it's a little frustrating, but uh, mm-hmm. holy cow, I love it up here. So when did you first feel like you lived at home when you came here? Uh, I think pretty much immediately. I mean, it was... I remember um, it was Labor Day 2001, mm-hmm. and, you know, and then the the rains kind of set in, you know, around October or whatnot. And I'm like, holy cow, it's raining. It's raining. It's rained like 25 days in a row. Holy cow. Uh, you know, and you just, you just live with it. I mean, you just have to kind of go with it and live with it. And, you know, the summers, I mean, that's, that's. That's what I love so much about Oregon is just the summers. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. And yes, we pay a price, but I'll gladly pay the price for the beautiful summers that we have up here. Oh, absolutely. It's gorgeous. Yes. You know, and I also believe in the the terroir of people. I think about the terroir of grapes and, and finished wine all the time. But um, there are so many people from so many places who have relocated and who are currently relocating to Oregon and the Willamette Valley. And just like we like our wine, um, a diverse and complex um, community is what, what makes us special. So one of the things that was hard for me, especially coming right from New York, um, is it took me a long time to drop my attitude. <laughs> because when, if you're listening to this and you're from the East Coast or New York, you have to have an attitude and you have to have a little bit of a sharp elbows because you, if you want to just get things done, you have to be a little bit abrupt because there are so many people in such a small amount of space and everyone right. is just trying to get things done. So it took me a while to chill out. And I think I'm still working on that. Uh, it, it's hard to lose that. Oh. Yeah. But I, I, you know, it seems like you kind of, you know, eventually did find your groove. You uh, uh, started getting into coding and, you know, in like 2014, you wrote a a Ruby on Rails social app for vegans and vegetarians of Portland so uh, people can interact with events, companies, and products. (laughs) How did you find that? That's really funny. (laughs) I did, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, also in 2014, you're at the Irving street kitchen and that's where you, uh, first, uh, met Chris. Yeah, absolutely. So I moved directly to the Pearl district in Portland, which is, um, you know, I, I wanted to live a walkable lifestyle and that is a neighborhood that is very close to downtown and, um, has everything you need within a few square blocks. So I was, um, yeah, I was living there and, I was a lady about town. I started, I moved from sort of the marketing ad tech side of the tech world and I learned how to code and I started building my own products. And um, yeah, Irving Street Kitchen was a restaurant in the Pearl District that was very integral to like the late 90s, early 2000s Mm -hmm. food scene. Um, RIP, it's not there anymore. I know. But I, yeah. I met Chris there and I was having a ladies night. I think, sorry to say AJ, but I think we were there complaining about guys and how I (laughs) didn't want to, I didn't want to have anything to do with guys for a little while. And of course that's the, that's the night that, that I met my significant other. And yeah, it was, it's really fantastic. And Chris and I share a lot of the same, you know, attitudes and lust for life. And we love great food and wine and yeah, we hit it off immediately. Yeah, no, that, that is awesome. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget, uh, you know, the story of, you know, Chris saying, Hey, you know, I have, uh, uh, Mikey Etzel and we're going to, you know, taste some, some wines. Do you want to come back and like taste? And you're like, no, (laughs) I know you you just had no clue. And that's just, I, I always love that. That's, you know, but you know, that was the first date. Of course, you're not going to go back and like, go taste wine with two strange guys. Why that only makes complete sense. Exactly. Yeah. So Chris and his father were, um, his father, Richard Herman, they were sort of toying with the idea of starting a little family wine project when I met them. And Mikey Etzel was working on the first few barrels of Pinot Noir. And um, they were actually working on tasting all the, the individual, the seven individual barrels to make the very first VGR 
very good red blend for the 2014 vintage. So we have that in library and sometimes we like to open a bottle and it's a really funny story because Chris did invite me to that blending session and I should have said yes, but I did say no because, you know, right. I'm a lady, I want to protect my time. Um, so now when we open it, he always refers to it as his creation and he makes fun of me because I wasn't allowed in the blending. Well, I didn't allow myself to go to the blending. But yeah. now um, I'm very adamant that both Chris and I uh, participate in every single blending session from now on. Yeah, no, that that is awesome. Uh, in 2016, you went up to Seattle for a startup weekend. What uh, I'm just, I couldn't find what projects or anything that you worked on. What what were you working on for that startup weekend? Well, um, when I arrived in Portland, I was very interested in the startup community, um, just like I am here in Willamette Valley in the wine community. And I find that there are a lot of like-minded people who are very creative. So uh, there were a number of startup events that I was interested in working on. Um, I think for that one, I was a judge for one of the, the local startup weekends, which was very fun because, um, I don't, I don't think they do them anymore. It was sort of like a time and place, but people would get together for the weekend and come up with a startup idea. And then by the end of the weekend, you would have to design and pitch your product. Yeah. No, I very much remember startup weekends. I'm like, Oh, I want to do that. Ugh, I can't, but I want to do it. Ugh. So yeah, no, I, a little bit of envy over here. So I'm glad you got to participate in one. Yeah. I mean, I think they're, you know, I, I hope that people are still doing them because, you know, just like what you're doing with, um, your app, uh, wine notes and your podcast and all of the, the media work that you're doing to promote the wines of the Willamette Valley. I think that, um, you can fully express yourself in projects like this and it takes, innovative people who say, I haven't done this before, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and do it to bring something into the world. So anyone who's an entrepreneur who, who starts something, I, I commend. And Startup Weekend was a little bit crazy. People would have the craziest ideas. And sometimes <laughs> you just sort of roll your eyes and say, okay, like you want to make electronic uh, crystals that change color with your mood. Okay. And then the judges would say, how exactly are you going to, are you going to bring this to market? It was sort of like the community based version of shark tank. It, exactly. Yeah. Most definitely. Oh, yeah. uh, as we kind of roll into 2017, that was a huge year for you. Oh, uh, and one of the things I found interesting was, uh, I think it also around that time, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was, you know, pretty much, yes, I wear the same outfit every single day. You know, Steve Jobs, I wear the same outfit every single day. And, uh, you know, you kind of had that same mentality. And I'm curious, do you do you feel the same way of like, you know, wearing the same outfit every single day to cut down on that uh, design fatigue? Or are you like, no, I want to be more creative or I've grown beyond that or like I'm just I'm share your thoughts. I'm super curious. Oh yeah. So, um, around that time I started, um, an app while well, I was working for a, a development company called DevNow in Portland. And we worked on a variety of client apps for, um, for Nike, for example, and Columbia, et cetera. And at that time I decided to start, um, an app called Scout Savvy, which would help, you know, women and, um, and people from diverse backgrounds find jobs for them based on the values that they were interested in, in 2017. So I was very like, I, you know, I'm a millennial. And so I'm like very immersed in the time. So at that time, Facebook was very, very exciting. Twitter was very exciting. This is before Facebook owned Instagram. This is before TikTok existed. Um, so it was a very dynamic, fun, um, culture to be involved in, especially if you're technically inclined. So. There were a lot of sort of ancillary values that came with this and everyone was worshiping Steve Jobs. I think, you know, when the first iPad came out and when every new iPhone would come out, it was like a big thing when Steve Jobs was still alive. You would go to the Apple store and let me know if you did this, AJ. I bet oh, yeah, I totally did it. Stand in line, stand in line for the next generation. Oh, and yeah. I remember when I was in Boulder, I even tried, I knew someone who worked at the Apple store there. I tried to bribe him, bribe with cupcakes. <laughs> but he wouldn't let me cut the line. So, yeah, um, no. 
Yeah, it's very much a cultural thing. Did you participate in any of that excitement? Oh, totally. I mean, when the yeah. iPad came out, uh, I was, you know, in line at Bridgeport in Lake Oswego with my stepson. It was raining. It, I didn't care. We were both out in the rain waiting and just got that first iPad. And it was, you know, I remember waiting hours and hours and hours in line for the new iPhone. And in some respects, yeah, from a process standpoint, it is uh, much easier to just pre-order one and get it the day of, deliver to your door. But, you know, there's just something magical about waiting in line and getting that next that next device. I, I kind of miss it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and there was a community thing about it, too, that I really liked. Um, but, yeah, it was very much of a time. And I think that I've, I've outgrown a lot of that because of everything that we've seen with um, – scandals at Facebook, uh, Steve Jobs has sort of passed away. And so that the cult of Steve Jobs is gone. And then there was the whole um, Theranos Elizabeth Holmes scandal where she was completely ripped, like ripping off of being the, the next young female Steve Jobs. So right. uh, I think I've gotten over some of that, but there are, are lessons that I totally learned from that period in my life. Um, a lot of lessons about entrepreneurship, how to build a company, how not to, how to responsibly integrate technology in, into what I'm doing. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I go through themes. I was thinking right. about this the other day. I went through a theme where I was wearing black quite often, um, kind of like Picasso went through his blue period, right? Now I'm in the yellow period. So <laughs> I'm going yellow now. Nice. Uh, part of it is to match the uh, yellow wax capsules that we have on the double zero wine Chardonnay. So um, we've been in lockdown and the pandemic's been crazy. We haven't really traveled for a few years, but now we're starting to do events. And so my goal is to wear yellow at every event. No, that is, that is awesome. Oh, yeah. uh, right before your launch party or uh, you had your launch party for Scout Savvy in May. And then mm -hmm. you also got a, a, a nice little award and you kind of reflected back on that event and you wrote, before the program began, I booked it for the bathroom while everyone called uh, or was called to take their seats in the convention center ballroom. I didn't have to go. I just wanted to stand in the stall facing the closed door and have a few moments by myself. Don't ask. It's an introvert thing. Have you gotten over the introverted thing or, you know, do you still find yourself at times like when you're pouring for James Suckling where you just need, you know, just a few moments of like... <gasps> <sighs> mm. I definitely have not gotten over the introvert thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So the award ceremony that you're referring to is the um, technology association of Oregon um, has an awards ceremony every year. It's called, I think it's called the Oregon tech awards. And um, when I built this app scout savvy, I really am proud of it. It was a really fantastic product. Um, and I remember we had the winery at that time, but it was still a, a little thing. We didn't know that it was going to turn into this, um, you know, big business. And I was at a dinner party in Portland one night and one of our friends turned to us and said, okay, you've got this winery thing, Chris, Catherine, you've got this um, app thing you're doing. And Chris, you're still working full time as an attorney. What are, what are you guys doing here? What's going to happen? Right. And we just said, you know, we are very excited about everything we're working on. And we made a deal together that whatever would, whichever company would sort of um, become the exciting rocket ship, then we would totally both as a couple orient that way. So um, at the time, Scout Savvy was really exciting. I got an award for pre-revenue company, which sounds really silly for people who are not in the tech world because it's like, if you don't have any revenue, are you really a company? But um, at that time in the in the tech startup world, it was really all about users and growth. So now I actually still have that award um, in my office because it kind of makes me laugh as I'm processing orders now. We actually do have revenue at the winery. <laughs> so, um, but that was an exciting moment because I knew that entrepreneurship was my path. Um, right. I still do enjoy writing as a part of what I do, but I really enjoy the the thrill of creating something and bringing it into the world. So you're asking about introversion and am I over it? No, I think my personality is very introspective and internal, but I've really 
put myself out there, especially after that moment, because I feel like if you put in um, so much creative effort, especially with a team to bring something into the world, it's like a duty. You must then introduce people to it. Right. So I don't, I don't view it as something that's difficult. I just view it as something I enjoy the creation part. Um, right. I think more than I do the, the presentation part, but now when I get out and I, I do tastings and I travel and we're meeting with reviewers, I really do enjoy it because to me, it's sort of like the end game of the creative process that I enjoy the most. And I love it when I get, you know, Instagram photos of people um, drinking our wine, emails saying, oh, I, I had a special night last night. I opened up one of your bottles and here's what I thought about it. So I really, really enjoy that. But I also do take a, a moment um, before every reviewer meeting for sure. Well, yeah, I, I can only imagine. I mean, having James Suckling come over and like, you know, you know, at your house there in Carlton and like taste your wines. I mean, that had to, I would have been like, okay, I can't mess up kind of thing. And just a little bit beside myself. So I can, I, I get it. Yeah. I think, um, whenever you're working to create something, there's always a, a judgment of something when you put it out in the world, even if you're not getting scored against your peers by a wine critic and, yeah, one of, one of the personal lessons I've learned recently is that it's important to just do it authentically and do it because you love it. And then what you produce, people will either like or not like, but you know, you'll yeah. find the right audience for what you're doing. Um, so that's what we try to do at, at Double Zero Wines is to really create something as a team that we're specifically and especially really proud of. And it's, it's great to get some recognition. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most definitely, you know, and, you know, talking about 2017 being big, I mean, 2018 was probably even a, a bigger stepping stone because that's, you know, from what I can tell, that's really when you went, you know, uh, down the rabbit hole for double zero wines, you got married to Chris at the Carlton winemaker studio. You hired a uh, Wynn Peterson Nedry as a winemaker and then Thanksgiving 2018, you fly out to uh, New York with a case of uh, wine and of Double Zero's wine. And you're just kind of, you know, going all over promoting it and, you know, getting people to, to taste it. Um, what was that like? I mean, being back in New York uh, and just trying to figure out, well, not figure out, but, um, you know, now you're, you know, a hundred percent on, on double zero at this point. Well, what was that weekend like? And I'm just, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, for me personally, I think that was a really pivotal weekend. And, you know, just, just prior to that, we had started to get a little bit of attention. The 16s had come out. People were really, really loving the 2016 double zero Chardonnays. And I left my job. I was working after Scout Savvy. I was sort of aqua hired by another, um, you know, job matching app in Portland that was using um, AI technology. It was pretty interesting, but I um, was either going to get fired or I had to quit because, because I was leaving my desk so often to take orders from the ladies' bathroom. <laughs> um, I was answering the phone like, hi, this is double zero wines, just praying that somebody didn't come in and wash their hands or something. <laughs> um, so for us as a family business, we, you know, we, Chris and I put everything that we have into what we're doing. So, um, I went out with one of my girlfriends to New York for Thanksgiving weekend, and I brought a suitcase full of double zero. And there's something that happens inside of you when you've worked so hard and you know, as an entrepreneur that it's up to you to make this work. So there are no salespeople. <laughs> we had no distribution <laughs> in New York at the time. And right. so how are we going to get this in front of people in the, in really the greatest wine market in the entire world for sophisticated wine drinkers? It's New York because they, they primarily drink European wine. Um, so yeah, I just loaded up a suitcase. I stayed at the W in the union square. Um, both of us stayed in the same room and just, Every day I would wheel it out and hit the wine shops and hit different restaurants. And 
Yeah, I mean, I would think that as a shy person that that would be difficult, but no, I mean, when, when it really all depends on you and you're really proud of what you're doing, um, you really want to yeah, showcase what you have. And it's, I don't think it's bravery, but it's more like a, a conviction of the heart. So I think that, you know, I rolled into some very, very exclusive wine shops in Manhattan and I, I said, hi, I'm from Oregon. Do you want to taste my wine? <laughs> right. I looked like I was from Oregon. And what I didn't know is that the, the Thanksgiving Day weekend is the biggest weekend in all of New York for sales. Being from the East Coast, I, I understood the attitude. I mean, some people were like, listen, why are you here? I'm so busy. Like, <laughs> just leave it here. And you're like, leave me alone. It's like, right. thank you for even saying hi to me. Um, yes. Yeah. And I remember there was also a Burgundy um, documentary launch that we, that I was there for too, that my girlfriend and I went to. And I was talking to a lot of the people in the room and there was this wonderful gentleman who's one of our clients today. And he was so, so humble. I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm interested in trying your Chardonnay. I was talking to him about it. And he said, I said, oh, well, I have some samples. Can I drop one off at your office tomorrow? And he said, oh yeah, definitely. That would be fantastic. So I went to a FedEx store. I got this little like Christmas bag. Right, with like right. tissue paper and I put it in there. I mean, it's definitely not the double zero sophisticated packaging that you're used to now. And I was like, okay, it's um, uh, where's your office? Okay. It's in the fifties. Okay. I know where that is. I'll, I'll go there tomorrow. So I show up, there's this giant man in the lobby of this building. I'm five, seven. I was wearing heels too. So pretty tall. This man was like seven feet tall. Holy and cow. He got, I know, he got between me and the elevator door and he was like, what are you doing here? By the way, this building was not just a little office building. It was like a 50 floor office tower. Oh my um, goodness. And I, I said, I'm from Oregon. Um, I have a bottle of wine. It's a gift for, you know, Mr. So-and-so. And he was like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. That guy likes wine. <laughs> you can go up. Um, so I went up and he works for a, a big like technology venture capital firm. Um, lovely, lovely young gentleman. Very, very excited about double zero wines now. So um, I just think in general, it's really important to put yourself out there. And that's one thing that Chris and I continue to do, even though a lot more people know about our wines now and we're shipping them all over the world. I never, ever stop having that spirit of giving and that spirit of excitement and sharing what we do. And, um, that's really written into the heart of everything that double zero is about. We really are dedicated to showcasing the Willamette Valley to people all around the world to show them the potential of what it is and also what it can be. Yeah. Yeah. No. So if, if we just take just a second, just to reflect on everything that you've done so far in your life, right? Yeah. Let me come back to the original question. Do you feel like you've become your own superhero? Um, I guess so. I mean, after telling that story, I guess so. Because <laughs> uh, I think I think coming from the the culture of New England that I described and then moving into this period of just knowing that you know, no, no one's here to rescue you. No one's here to sell the wine for you. Um, no one's here to, to pack and ship it for you. We have a fulfillment house now. So now there are people to pack and ship. Um, <laughs> but during the pandemic, we did a lot of that ourselves. So right. I think so. I mean, that's what I appreciate about the journey that I've been on because right now I'm 38 and a half. Uh, there's so much there's so much uh, more to go. And I think that the people that I respect the most in the history of the wine business, they have also been their own heroes. For example, um, Madame Boulanger of Boulanger, definitely uh, the Vouve Clicquot. Um, she was a real person. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, there's a really, really amazing book about her called The Widow that everybody should read. It's historical um, nonfiction and right. sort of, it's written by a, a historian who teaches at Colby college in Maine. And she does a lot of, uh, creative work to try to think about and understand what a woman 
like her must have been thinking um taking over a great champagne house and growing it into yeah a global powerhouse and now her historical story represents the entire region so i don't yeah. know what do you think it means to be your own superhero well i think you know ultimately yeah, i think when you're uh when you're young you know you you want to be like oh i want to be a policeman or i want to be a fireman or you know it's you you take this journey and you just want you know you know that seven year old or eight year old or ten year old to be like wow never in a million years did I think you'd be where you're at now right it's it it is that to me I mean you are you've done something just totally unimaginable that um, the the ten year old just couldn't possibly believe could have happened yeah the the ten year old would really enjoy that the story so far for sure it's full of adventure and of course i mean no one likes the hero's journey that is uh straight up and to the right i mean if it's not filled with uh uncertainty disappointments times where you almost don't make it times when you want to give up um it doesn't make the the high highs as satisfying right but you know it, you know being in the tech world you know that you want to you want to fail I mean, you definitely want to fail and you want to fail fast and you want to learn from those failures so you can build upon it and do better. So, I mean, that's, you know, not giving up is always the, the big point of all of it, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that really ties into what we're doing in wine as well, because for me, the adjustment from startups and technology into wine was very difficult because all of these lessons that I learned in the startup world, I wanted to take the template of <laughs> how do you run a tech company and how do you do startup weekend and just like put it on the wine right. business? It, that right. doesn't work. It doesn't um, work. <laughs> when I first started uh, building a team or I first started talking to people who are at an executive level in um, the wine business, I would say like, how do you do project management? How do you do like, do you do agile scrum? How do you plan? You know, what are, how do you do your budgeting? I mean, <laughs> it was crazy. It was, it was a very, very difficult for me to understand and to really internalize the fact that everything that I knew how to do that worked in this, in other industry does not work in wine. And right. the biggest thing is that, um, when you work in tech, it's all based here. So it's abstract thinking. And if you have an idea for your app, you can just pour yourself a glass of wine and, and code up a new feature at night and then ship it. And then it goes live the next day. Um, and we get one shot a year in wine. And so right. for me, learning how to work with the seasonality and to know that there are certain times in the year where you have to relax. There are certain times of the year when you go on the road, how you prepare for harvest. Um, it's a completely different lifestyle. So that's why in my office, I have a keep calm and drink champagne poster <laughs> uh, to remind myself that it's okay to, to relax because in the world of technology, Oftentimes, and we're taught this, um, speed is of the essence, not just the speed of the processors on the machines you're working on, but the speed of product development. Because often when you're innovating, there are people who are coming up behind you who maybe have a similar idea, who get to market faster. So yeah, everything yep. in my career has been like better, faster, stronger. And that doesn't, that doesn't work in wine. You have to let go a little bit. You do, but, you know, double zero itself, you know, is still innovating. I mean, um, I believe last year you started, you know, you got some con concrete fermenters and, you know, um, you mentioned earlier that the, uh, the 2021 vintage, you know, that wind did an absolutely amazing job. And what, um, what was the process for those concrete fermenters? Like why, uh, I know that, you know, currently, I mean, you, you use M4s, but like, why, why the concrete fermenters? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, we make primarily Chardonnay and about 25% of our production is Pinot Noir and our Pinot Noir has always been fermented in, um, terracotta amphora that we import from Tuscany. And I really, really like the freshness and the texture, um, that, that imparts, but we're always trying to push the envelope. So even though, uh, uh, I said that the wine business is different. You know, some of the things that Chris and I really do are we try to continue to push the envelope every single year. So in Burgundy, um, a lot of the wines that we know and love are fermented in concrete. 
So we decided to call up um, Manu, who is, is the owner of a company called iTech Wines in California. We buy our um, amphora from him. And we said, you know, we really, we want some uh, concrete and we want to talk to you about it. And what I didn't realize is that uh, you can get so many shapes of concrete. You can get pyramid shapes. You can get like semi-pyramid. You can get tulip. You can get you can get eggs. And a lot right. of people in Willamette Valley are now using concrete. So a lot of the winemakers will get together and, and talk about the shapes of their concrete and what they like about them and what, what they don't. So it's like anything. It's like um, cars. It's like... Uh, musical instruments when everyone gets together and talk talks about their guitar um so chris and i uh, as the proprietors of double zero we are involved in all of the decision making for what we do and what we want so yeah we were inspired by the great wine the great red wines of burgundy and concrete fermenters and we decided to experiment with that in 2021 um and the richard herman cuvee uh, Pinot Noir was, we did an experiment to ferment some of it in concrete and some of it in amphora like we usually do. And those wines are so vastly different. So um, we're excited to see if we'll be blending them together, if we'll separate them out and do two separate wines. Um, we do all of the blending um, the following August. So this August we'll be blending the uh, 2021. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, no, if nothing else, you should at least like keep, you know, uh, half a dozen, you know, in the concrete and a half a dozen in, in four just for yourself and see uh, how they compare and contrast over the years. Yeah, absolutely. So although um, we are a, like a traditional family based wine business, we really try to push the envelope every year. And that's been an exciting development for us. Yes, yes. Um so kind of going back to the, the wine that you dropped off this morning. Yeah. Um, so if I remember correctly, you know, it was, uh, October, 2020, I, you know, I came by to, I think, pick up some, some wine and, you know, you, you and Chris were very generous to let me come in the backyard and, you know, taste some experimental wine that, um, uh, was a, a joint, uh, project or a joint, yeah, just to, yeah. I'll say a joint project between you and and Adelsheim. Uh, what did that end up, you know, becoming, and uh, what was it used for, and all that good fun stuff? That was a fun day. That was a fun day. <laughs> um, so every year we participate in this really amazing event called the Willamette Valley Barrel Auction, and it raises money for. Um, the Willamette Valley Winers Association, which is a very important professional organization that helps all um, Willamette Valley wines get out into the world through promotions, events, etc. So they have an individual Pinot Noir lot that we've participated in, but there's also a very fun project they do every year. Um, they allow a few wineries to collaborate together on a Chardonnay lot. And um, we were excited because Gina Hennen is very good friends with Win Peterson Nedry, who um, made our wines that year, and they wanted to do a collaboration lot together. So we said, definitely, that sounds like a great idea. You know, you two um, make it happen. And we selected right. a really fun barrel from the Eola Amity Hills to blend with um, one of their vineyards from the Shahala Mountains. And so you were there on the day that Wynn brought over some samples with, I think, four different um was it four? I think you have the notes. Uh, three or four different types uh, of um, fining agents. I, I, yeah, I could, I could, I could pull up the notes real quick, but yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. The number doesn't matter, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, and Chris and I thought it would be fun for you to be one of the early uh, tasters because we kind of knew what we were excited about, but we wanted uh, an impartial palate to come and uh, help us out. And you, and you were there, and you uh, have a history of tasting a lot of breadth and depth of Willamette Valley wines. So that was fun. So I, yeah. I dropped off today uh, that finished wine and I'm really excited about how it's come together. Um, we, a fun story is that uh, Wynn is now focusing on her family project, Ridgecrest and RR 100%. And we are now working with an amazing winemaker named Matt Perry, who coincidentally, we didn't know at the time um, was the white winemaker 
under Gina at um, Adelsheim. So in that bottle, it's kind of like a, you know, serendipity coming together, integrated. Right. Um, Matt made the wine with Gina. Um, Wynn made that wine with Chris and I. And uh, yeah, so that wine to me represents sort of like the changing of the guard. Yeah, no, it it is. It, it, um, when I opened it up, I was very pleased with it. And I have to say that day when I was in the backyard with you and Chris, you know, we were talking about, you know, the whole being introverted and like being, you know, a little, just a little petrified and scared. I was like, <gasps> okay, I don't know. What, uh, I wasn't expecting this, but no, I thoroughly appreciate it that day. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think uh, part of the fun of the wine business and experimenting with wine and experiencing wine is really to like live with the wine, which means you don't always want to wait until you know, the wine gets a good score and then people want to buy it and then you store it and then you enjoy it at its moment of perfection. Um, just like a person, uh, the wine always has a journey that is filled with ups and downs. And just like life, the wine doesn't develop in a straight line. So uh, when we first started in the wine business, one of our mentors told us, never, ever, ever let people taste unfinished wine because, you know, this person kind of had an ego and they said, you know, other people, non-winemakers, they don't know if they taste a wine that's not like perfectly finished, they won't be able to see what it's about to become. And Chris and I are very anti that. I mean, the way that I learned about wine and trained my palate is to taste wine, um, a variety of wines from producers, people, um, vintages, great wine, bad wine, amazing wine, and wine in development. And that's the only way I really feel like you can train your palate in, in a way that will help you recognize the development of wine as it goes. So I, I thought that was a fun day. And yeah, um, yeah I, I learned about wine by having these experiences and, and not really knowing what I should be tasting. <laughs> but I think that's a very important thing to do. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Oh, uh, you just recently got back from, you know, several weeks of traveling and, you know, you were in Paris, um, you know, for some of those stops. I'm curious, did you revisit any of the places that you uh, visited your first time in Paris when you were 16 on this trip? Ooh, um, did we, we didn't do any museums this time. We didn't go back to the exact places. Oh, we did. We did a stroll down the Champs Elysees, and um, it's very commercial and corporate now. There were more like smaller boutiques when I was there when I was sixteen. But um, the spending money that I did bring, I spent it all on one sweater on the Champs Elysees. <laughs> it was like a, it was like a a hoodie cream colored sweater, and uh, my right. very cool aunt still makes fun of me for that because she was like. I tried to stop you, but you really wanted it. So I said, fine. <laughs> um, but we were there because we were invited to be a part of, through the Oregon Wine Board, a special tasting of Oregon and California wines uh, at the residence of the American ambassador in France. And that was a really transformative day for me, actually, because, you know, we were staying down the street and um, we were staying in a hotel that was just a few blocks away from the original address and actually the currently the headquarters of Chanel um, in Paris, the right. Gabrielle. Um, so that was pretty amazing as like a female entrepreneur to be walking by the address of where she originally started and to think, you know, that before Karl Lagerfeld and before Chanel was a thing, there was a woman who was making clothes and hats for people and selling them. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I reflected a lot actually about on that trip. And I did think like, wow, my 16 year old self would be like, you are doing good. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and, uh, and so we walked down the night before on the Rue St. Honoré, which is where um, the residence is. And that is the road. That is the road where all the high-end fashion shops are. So because I knew we were doing like an official um, official event, 
I kind of brought conservative clothing. It was all beige. I had like a beige skirt, a white collared shirt, and a beige jacket because, you know, I wanted to be like professional. Right, right, right. But the night before I was, we were walking down the road and, and looking at all the stores. I had kind of like a funky outfit. I had like this um, sort of leopard print skirt and this black satin top and black high heels and bright red lipstick, actually Chanel. Um, <laughs> and I thought, I actually did think about my 16 year old self. And then I thought about Gabrielle Chanel and I said, self, past self, future self, present self, do I want my Parisian debut of my luxury product to happen while I'm dressed in a beige outfit? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was no, we do no. not do beige. <laughs> right. So I wore my, I wore my wildest outfit that was still, you know, appropriate. high end and appropriate. Right. Um, but I did wear my bright red Chanel lipstick to give myself confidence for that day. And I would say that that that's a really important chapter in the story of me and the story of double zero, because, um, yeah, I think it is very important for Chris and I with Double Zero to share the story of Willamette Valley on a global stage. Um, but I think it's also good to recognize where we all come from and where we're all going because woven within the wines of Willamette Valley and the wines of every region is, is the story of the people behind them, which is why I really appreciate what you're doing, AJ, because if you just line up bottles and you're just tasting the wines, I mean, they don't really come alive in, in general. Um, I'm not talking about specific wines. I'm talking about all wines. But if you've been right. to the region, if you've met the people, if you know the intention, if you know the historical significance of what you're tasting, um, if you've seen the maps, et cetera, uh, the wine just means something so much more and something so different. So that's it why I, I really appreciate that you're telling the story behind all of the wines that people can taste and enjoy from this region. Yeah, no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And one of the reasons I, I have done that is because, you know, in tech, you know, it, it's all about scrum. It's all about agile and it's all about just getting the product shipped and out the door. Right. Um, and so the human is lost and I'm just like, no, we can't lose, you know, the human aspect and, um, doing what I'm doing. I have nobody that I have to answer to except for myself. So I just get to have as much fun as I can, as, as much as I want, which is awesome. Yeah, no, I think it's fantastic. And you totally embody the, the spirit of the entrepreneur as well. And you, whether you acknowledge it or not, you're part of the wine business. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're, you're up here with us now because uh, communicating the story of the wines of any region is, is vastly important, not just to the economic vitality of the community, but also um, people are coming here. They're looking at the Willamette Valley. They want to learn about us and who we are and what we stand for. Um, and it's a place where you can come and it's sort of like our town. You can see your favorite Willamette Valley celebrities sort of out doing their thing. <laughs> Tony Soder the other day was, I saw him going into Third Street Books on McMinnville. And, um, you know, if you go to Community Plate breakfast in the morning in downtown McMinnville, you'll see winemakers and vineyard managers and people's little kids running around and uh, yeah, telling the story of the people here. I think it's really important. Yeah, no, I, I, I hope to, to do my best. Yeah. Um, so this, this next question is going to be a little bit, you know, kind of, kind of difficult, but uh, you know, inside the double zero foundation, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of legacy. You know, you have, you know, even with your labels, with the Freya and the Richard and the Herman, sorry, the Freya, Richard and Catherine Herman Cuvées, right? Family is built into it. Um, and, you know, we talked about, you know, 10 year old self looking at, you know, yourself now. And, you know, it was like, no, there's no way I could even possibly imagine. So where do you see double zero in, in 30 years? I mean, I know that's a difficult question, but like with that legacy part of it in, in mind and whatnot. I mean, what, what do you see double zero being in 30 years? Hmm. You know, we have thought a lot about this 
uh, because the story of family is so woven into what we're doing. And Chris really grew up here in the Willamette Valley and his parents immigrated from Europe and uh, they were professors at Oregon State University and Oregon gave them everything and they gave so much to the state of Oregon. And we can talk about that another time for sure because their family is really woven into the history here, especially of the Willamette Valley. And Chris has been behind the scenes working on the business side um, for many decades, involved in a lot of things that um, people will never know about. And that's really, that's really cool to know that he's had a hand in that. So I really take what I'm doing with Double Zero very, very seriously because the investment to start this came from Chris's father's savings uh, from the university. And so every dollar that we spend right now, I know exactly um, where it's coming from. And so we're dedicated to remaining a, a family business. And so people ask us sometimes, why don't you have your own winery? Why don't you have your own tasting room? Why don't you have your own vineyards? And for us, we really are excited about just creating the most special, incredible experience in the bottle. And we're really lucky to work with incredible farmers and an incredible winemaking team to help this vision um, come alive. So right. I'm really inspired by the families of Burgundy and Champagne and the fact that, you know, people don't retire or maybe they'll retire when they're they, their kid is like, you need to get out of here, dad and right, mom. Right, right. Um, but you still see the old people out on the sorting line. You still pe see people milling around. You know, we were in Champagne at Julian and Sarah Lenoir's place. Uh, we Champagne Paul Lenoir. We work with them on the Double Zero Champagne. And his father was just sort of, you know, bebopping around, you know, in a toolbox, like organizing some screws and fixing machines. And he's like, oh, that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for Double Zero, we're dedicated to remaining a family-based business forever. Right. I'm knocking on some wood here. Um, yes, yes. Because I, I'm really influenced by um, the old European heritage of Chris's family and his father taught me a lot about these old values in the family history. And they have a long history of entrepreneurs in the family in Europe as well. So in 30 years, I hope that we are still doing what we're doing. Um, maybe we'll have right. a vineyard, maybe we'll have our own winery then just so that we can have our own equipment to uh, control. And I would like to design a Burgundian style barrel room instead of stacking the barrels, just like one barrel on these like long, you know, a long gravel cellar. Right. So um, my goal is to just personally, the way my story ends, this is the way I want it to end is to be okay. one of those really, really old ladies like um, Madame Bislevois in Burgundy in my late eighties, early nineties, still out there stomping around uh, vineyards and checking on barrels and uh, bossing people around and telling them what to do. <laughs> um, so, there's a lot happening in the Willamette Valley. There are a lot of transactions that are happening. I personally think that that's exciting because like I said before, um, we need a diverse and complex economy here. People need jobs, people need to be paid. We need transportation, we need restaurants, we need hotels, we need people to be a part of that. And we, it's the inflection point. The Willamette Valley does need to grow and that takes resources. Um, but I really want to remain a family-based business that we're running and people forget, um, a family-based business that is thriving, that started in California with an attorney and his young, hardworking wife, Jackson family wines. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, I don't know if we'll ever be that big, but I, <laughs> I'm excited about um, continuing our family heritage, and we're really just starting here at Double Zero. So we've got many, many decades to make that happen. And Chris has oh. three wonderful daughters and uh, wonderful grandsons, so um, we'll, we'll definitely be putting them to work soon. That sounds great. I can't wait to, to see what, uh, how it all turns out. Same with me. But yeah. we'll see. We'll we'll be here together, AJ. And as each chapter is written, we'll we'll be reading the book together, right? I love it. Yes, most definitely. Uh, shall I wrap things up with some rapid fire questions? Sure. Okay. 
So you're taking a road trip all by yourself to say like Texas. Do you navigate there with a physical map or do you use Apple Maps? Definitely Apple Maps. And I'll definitely get lost. Um, <laughs> but um, I will just blame it on uh, the latest version of iOS and how stupid it is. There you go. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite indulgent food? My favorite indulgent food is... Yes. Um, I think it's Maine lobster with butter. A classic Ooh. boiled Maine lobster. I do not like fancy lobster. I don't like lobster bisque, lobster mac and cheese. I don't like the French style lobster. With um, I'm an entrepreneur still working, so I get my notifications are on. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, so boiled Maine lobster with butter, just straight out of the ocean, cooked in boiled seaweed. Mm, that sounds pretty good. Oh, uh, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Ooh, a superpower? Yeah. Mm, I think my superpower, my first inclination is to say, like, see into the future because I want to know what's going to happen. I'm the kind of person where I read the first page of a book and I read the last page of a book before I start <laughs> reading the book. It's a bad habit. Um, so that's my inclination, but I do not want to do that. So I would say... My superpower would be to, um, like travel instantaneously. Like I hate flying, but I love traveling. Right. So if I could just like close my eyes and be in Australia or France in a minute without having to like do the travel thing, that's what I would want to do. Instant teleportation. I love it. Yes. Yes. Uh, favorite superhero. Um, I would say Iron Man. I like Iron oh. Man. Yep. Okay. I like that uh, he's an inventor, he's an entrepreneur, and he can do multiple things. He can fly, he's got an exoskeleton. Um, yeah, yeah the, yeah, the entrepreneurial superhero. Very nice. Uh, last book you read, it could be digital, it could be audio, it could be physical. Um, the last book I read was, yeah, when we were flying last time, I read um, Sometimes a Great Notion by Ken Kesey. And okay. that is a, a book about uh, Oregonians. And oh, okay. that's all I'll say. Chris said, sometimes I said, I don't really get this, the Oregon farmer thing. It's a, it's a totally different way of thinking about the world. And he said, if you really want to understand like the rural Oregon mindset, you have to read Sometimes a Great Notion by Ken Kesey. It's about a logging family. Okay. All right. I'll have to check that out. I haven't never heard of it. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very very popular especially in Oregon when it came out because it was it was about Oregonians here but as a transplant to Oregon you should read it. Okay? Yeah, no, I definitely will. My uh I'm trying to think of my transplant book. It was uh it was like a fly fishing book. Uh, mm -hmm. and I can't remember uh the river why or something of that nature. I can't remember. But anyway. Yeah, that was an interesting book. Um, but yeah, that's all the questions that I have. Is there anything else that, uh, I didn't talk about that you'd like to, to bring up? Uh, no, you really covered it and you uncovered my past life as a tech entrepreneur. I don't, <laughs> I don't really get a chance to talk about that too often, but, um, yeah, I just want to reiterate AJ that, um, it's really great to be a part of your work. I'm really excited about what you're doing and the Willamette Valley is so vibrant. There's so many fun things happening here right now, a lot of growth and development, but I really think it's the right kind of growth and development. And yeah, double zero, we're all about exploring the potential of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and there's so much more um, to the story. So thank you so much for having me and for really digging deep into these stories and sharing them with the world. I really appreciate it. And I know all of your fans do too. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I uh, can't thank you enough. Thank you. All right. Thanks, AJ. All right. Thank you.